All right, Father Abraham, are you ready to stand up and do it? We're gonna do it today? No, we're not gonna do it. We're still, we're still not gonna sing the Father Abraham song today. Uh, I think there's a petition going around to, to make this happen. I'm not signing it, but we'll see. <laughs> Uh, Father Abraham is, I mean, we know Abraham is this person from the Old Testament. We've heard that name before. We may not know exactly who he is, but he seems important in our minds. Well, the New Testament writers, the Apostle Paul especially, said that anyone who has faith is a child of Abraham. So if you have faith in Jesus, then we need to pay attention to who Abraham is because there are some attributes of Abraham, both good and bad, that we sort of inherit Uh, as being sort of spiritually descended from Abraham. So that's why we're digging into his life, and we're gonna look at that from Genesis chapter 15 today. Uh, In uh, the summer of 2007, I was doing student ministry in Georgia, and uh, we were planning a trip to Mexico, central Mexico, the town of San Luis Potosi, where we had a missions partner there, and we were taking a youth group. So high schoolers were going to Mexico for a week. And so you can imagine leading up to this trip, there was a lot of planning and phone calls and and questions and how are we going to convince parents to send their 15-year-olds to central Mexico with us for a week. That's a tough sell for a lot of parents. And so we, I mean, we worked hard, we planned out, we thought of every contingency, we consulted people. And by the time the trip came, I thought, there, there is, there's nothing that can happen that I'm not prepared for. Why are you laughing? What? I, haven't, I haven't told any jokes yet. Day one, I got sick and could not move very far away from the restroom for four days. <laughs> I did not plan for that contingency. I had no plan for the leader of the trip going down on day one. Uh, my plans versus God's plans. The good news is I lost about 10 pounds that week. It was great. (laughs) Awesome. The trip went great, but man, it was just one of those smack in the face reminders that we we really wish we could see the future, don't we? We really wish we could either know how things are going to go or control how things are going to go, and yet we can't. We just can't, and we, we get ourselves in so much trouble when we try to control or know the future uh, in ways that God has not equipped us or or revealed to us to know. So let's look at how this works out in the life of Abram and Sarai. Remember, we're still calling them Abram and Sarai. Their names have not yet been changed to Abraham and Sarah, and I will mess that up, I promise, this morning, but we're we're gonna try. So from Genesis chapter 15, let's pick up in verse two. If you see anything on the screen that's underlined, those are your lines, uh, please join in, read that. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no child, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him aside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So we know God has made this promise that Abram is going to be the father of a great nation. And yet he doesn't have any children. So how can he be the father of a great nation when he doesn't have any children? That's his question. So he asks this question, God, what can you give me? God, I want to know how this is gonna work out in the future. I'm an old, old man. (laughs) And my wife is a oldish woman. How is this going to happen? God, I want to know what's gonna happen in the future. I want to know how you're going to work this out. There is this thing that Abram knows. He knows that God has made a promise. And then there's this thing that he wants to know, how God is going to fulfill his promise. And in this gap between what he knows and what he wants to know, he he finds himself in this place where it's kind of just like darkness. And what he wants is for God to shine a spotlight on the future. And to show him exactly what's in the future. Oh, I don't like that. (laughs) That's what he wants. So this is the the future that Abram is, is wanting God to reveal to him. But since he doesn't know it, he feels like he's in the darkness. 
right? You ever feel like you're in darkness because you don't know the future? We can get those lights back on. I don't trust you guys. Um, <clears throat> this, this is what it feels like when there's a gap between what we know and what we wish we knew, what we want to know. This is where Abram finds himself. And so God responds to his request. He says, what can you give me? And what he's wanting is lay out the schedule. God, I wanna know the day, the time, the year. Tell me how this is gonna happen. God's answer to his question is very different. He takes him outside and he says, look up at the stars. Now, I don't, we don't get to do this as, as, as Abraham did it uh, at this time. We look up and we, we can see some stars, but without all of the, the, the electric light in the, in the world at that time, what he saw is different than what we see, unless you go to like Alaska. I went to Alaska last summer with my boys and uh, it was cloudy most of the time, but it was a couple times you could look up and you could see more stars than I thought existed. And God says, look at the stars, so shall your offspring be. So instead of giving Abram a plan, God actually just shines a spotlight on his own power. He says, I, I made that. All those stars you see, I did that. If I can do that, do you think you can trust me to fulfill my promise and provide an heir for you? And the next thing we read is Abram believed the Lord. He just believed him. He saw this display of power. He made the connection in his mind. If the God who did that made a promise to me, I can trust him, right? And he demonstrates great faith. It's credited to him as righteousness. So these heroes of faith sometimes do the right thing, but not all the time. Next, uh, God is gonna reiterate another promise of verses uh, seven and eight. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, to take possession of it. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, that I will gain possession of it. Has that ever been a part of your prayer? God, I, I know you said, but how can I know? I, this is why we find Abram so relatable. He just had this conversation about his children. Now he's having the same conversation about the land. And again, God goes through this covenant ritual with him and demonstrates his faithfulness, but he never gives him a plan. He never gives him a schedule, a calendar to go by. He just shines a spotlight on his own power and faithfulness. And Abram believes him. Until we get to chapter 16, um, where uh, we're gonna read about this moment when uh, his wife gets caught up in this same space. So 16, let's pick up there. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So this promise is still sort of out there. They know they're supposed to have children, but it's not happening. And there is, so there's this thing that Sarai knows, or she thinks she knows, that God is preventing her from having children. That's what she believes is happening. This is what she knows. It's just really what she thinks she knows. It's actually not the, the truth of the matter, but it's what she thinks she knows. And then there's what she wants to know, which is, how is this gonna work out? And when she finds herself in this place between what she knows and what she wants to know, she decides to take control. This lack of clarity, this feeling like she's in the dark and she wants God to shine a spotlight on the future, she just says, well, if you're not gonna tell me, I'll figure it out myself. And so she reverts to something that is common practice in her day and age, which is if, uh, if, if a slave has any property, that property belongs to the master, not to the slave. The slave can't really own things, including children. So if a slave has a child, the child belongs to the master. Could even be the master's child and treat it as the master's child. So she says, here's what we're gonna do. You're, you're gonna have a child through my slave and that child will be your child. And in this way, we're gonna help God along fulfilling his promise. And Abram goes along with the plan. He doesn't question or raise an issue or say, hey, let's think about this or can we go out and look at the stars tonight? He just says, okay. Sarah finds herself in this place where there's this gap between what she knows or thinks she knows and what she wants to know. So she reverts to the familiar in exchange for the faithful. How often do we do that? 
When we, we don't know how things are gonna work out, so we just go back to what we know, what's familiar, what's comfortable. And sometimes uh, that leads us to step outside of, of God's will and God's plan. Because when there's this gap for you, uh, you want to know how things are gonna go in the future. Maybe you, it has something to do with your family and you wanna know how your kids are gonna turn out or how your grandkids or who they're gonna marry and where they're gonna live and how that's gonna impact you and where you wanna live. And or maybe it has to do with your finances and your job and you wanna know, is there a promotion down the road? Am I ever gonna make more money? Am I ever gonna have a job I really like, a boss I really respect? How is this all gonna work out? God, you've promised that, that, that you, you love me and you care about me, but I know that. I know you're good. I just don't know how that's gonna show up in my life. And we, uh, this lack of clarity makes us feel like we're in the dark. And so when we feel like we're in the dark, when we feel like there's no clarity, we reach for control. We say, well, if you're not gonna reveal your plan to me, if you're not gonna tell me how you're gonna do this, then I'll take over because we'd rather be in control than be in the dark, right? I would, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty natural human response. I'd rather be in control than be in the dark and let somebody else be in control. This is why some of you, if, if you're in the car with multiple people, you want to be in the driver's seat. Yes, can I, who's, who's here? I know some of you are here. You want to be in the driver's seat, because why? You don't trust anybody else, right? You just don't trust anybody else. To, to get you there safely, to, to go the correct route, right? That's really a big part of it, isn't it? Like, they're gonna go the wrong way. They're gonna go a way I don't like. So we would so much rather be in control than let somebody else be in control. I missed something there. It was probably about me. No, okay. So instead of this lack of clarity pushing us to reach for control over things God has not given us permission to take control over, what it should do for us instead is give us an opportunity to demonstrate curiosity and courage. Here's what I wanna encourage you and challenge you to do. The next time you find yourself in this place where there's this gap between what you know, you know that God is good, and then what you wish you knew, which is how God is gonna show up in a good way in your life, let that push you toward curiosity and courage. One of the curious questions we can ask when we find ourselves in this dark place where we don't know what's gonna happen is to ask, I wonder if anyone else has ever felt this way. I wonder if anyone else has ever had this experience. This is why I love the way Matthew is talking about scripture, how it doesn't really polish people up, it just gives it to us straight so we can look at Abram and go, I get it, I understand. We can look at Sarai and go, I understand, I felt the same way. And that's that curiosity going, I wonder if anybody's ever felt this way. Well, actually, a hero of our faith has felt this exact same way when in this space where he feels like he's in the dark. So let that drive us to curiosity and then to courage to say, I'm gonna act as though what I know is true is actually true. If I say, I know God is good, I am going to act as though God is good. And that means I can trust him with the things I don't know and don't understand. I can let go of control because I have a good God, a good father who loves me and cares for me and wants good for me. That's, that's what it should drive us to do. But sometimes we don't do that. We reach for control and there are consequences for that. So this is kind of part two of the sermon um, is, is what happens next when uh, Abram and Sarai reach for control so uh, Hagar, the slave, has a baby. And after she has the baby, uh, her relationship with Sarai uh, shifts in a negative way. And it, and it says that she began to despise Sarai. That she, something shifted and she doesn't, she, maybe she feels like she's been used in a way that, that was like unkind and disrespectful um, maybe she feels some sort of superiority because she can have a child and Sarai couldn't, but she begins to despise Sarai. And Sarai says, this, this, Abram, look what you've done. That's what she says, look what you've done. Now, what are we gonna do about it? And here's, here's what he says, verse six, your slave is in your hands. Abram said, do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And at this point, the attention of the narrative turns to this Egyptian slave woman. 
Okay, this, this story that is supposed to be about Abram, this man who's been chosen and his whole family chosen to be blessed by God and ultimately the whole world is gonna be blessed by this family. And now the attention of the narrative shifts to this Egyptian slave woman because the attention of God is on her. Uh, and so she is mistreated by, Hagar, uh, by Sarah. She goes out into the desert uh, with her baby and uh, uh, she's got no shot at surviving out there. There's, there's really not much of a chance she's gonna make it where she's going. Maybe she's going back to Egypt where she is from. And there's just, there's just not much of a chance she's gonna make it. But it's better for her in her mind to die out in the wilderness than to stay in this household where she is being mistreated so harshly. And, and when she's in the wilderness, God's attention is on her in a special way. He shows up through a messenger, he says, you're gonna have a son and his name is going to be Ishmael. The name Ishmael means God hears, God hears. He says, I'm, I'm going to bless him. He is, he's, he's gonna survive. And he, he's gonna be a powerful nation in his own right. And, and what I want us to see here is that God cares about those who have been hurt by his people. So, so part of that reality is God's people sometimes hurt people. I wish that wasn't true. I wish I had never been a part of that, but I have. God's people sometimes hurt people. And often those people who are hurt by God's people, they run away. And you would too. It's painful when you're hurt by the people of God. The people that, I mean, for, for Hagar, she sees this special relationship they have with, with this God, and in her mind, this, they should be like the, the models of, of what God is like. If God is good, then Abram and Sarah should be good. And if they're not good, maybe this God isn't good either. And some people feel that way about the church. They've been hurt by God's people and they think, well, if this is what God's people are like, maybe this is what God is like. And if that's the case, I don't want anything to do with him. Maybe you know some people who have felt that way. Maybe you have felt that way. Sometimes God's people hurt people. And God demonstrates in this moment that he cares about people who have been hurt by his people. And he shows up in a very um, clear way. Here's... here's Hagar's response to her encounter with God in the wilderness, verse 13, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. God doesn't change her status as a slave. He actually sends her back. He says, you have to go back and live with Abram and Sarai. He doesn't, you know, solve all of her problems. He doesn't, make excuses for Abram and Sarai's behavior. He doesn't punish them for that, but he sees her. And somehow that was enough. I mean, I think about what would make her go back? Why would she go back to this person who was mistreating her so badly she decided it would be better to take my baby and die in the wilderness than stay one more day in this house? What would make her go back? She becomes convinced that the almighty, powerful creator God of the universe sees her. And it's enough. And friends, if, if you have been hurt by the church or by the people of God in some way, God sees you. He sees you. He may not solve all your problems. He may not make excuses for the people who have hurt you. He's definitely not gonna do that. But he sees you. If you know someone who's been hurt by the church, most likely they're not here because of that reason. But if you know someone, what they need to know is God sees them. And, and the, the greatest demonstration of this in all of history is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to earth in, in the, as a baby to demonstrate that God sees us. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Not only does he see us, but he is with us. And this Jesus, as he walks around on earth as a, as a human being, he, he listens to people. 
He listens as they talk about their troubles and their fears and their doubts. He gives them space for all of that. He asks them questions. He sees their needs, both physical and spiritual, and he meets them. And he says this to his audience, which includes you and me, in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we come to Jesus with our doubts and fears, with this feeling like we're in the dark and we just don't know what's gonna happen or we've been hurt by the people of God and we can't make a connection between how the people of God can treat us this way and yet we still call God good and we have these doubts and confusions, Jesus says, come to me. He says, you've got all these burdens, you've got these doubts, you've got these uncertainties, I can handle all of that. And he doesn't give us a plan. He doesn't give us a schedule for exactly how he's gonna work things out He doesn't give us the play-by-play for what's gonna happen next, but he makes a promise. I will give you rest. Well, what is that gonna look like? I don't know, but I'm curious. I'm curious if anyone else has ever found rest in Jesus before. Maybe I should ask around or read scripture and find out. Has anyone else ever felt this way? Has anyone else ever experienced the peace of God? The rest that Jesus promises. And then I'm gonna act with courage. I'm gonna trust that God is good. I'm gonna look up at the stars at night and think if the one who made that has made a promise to me, can I trust him? Yes, I can. I wanna give us just a few ways I think we can demonstrate courage in the face of darkness. When we don't see what's ahead, we don't understand how things are working out. There's this gap between what we know and what we wish we knew. What can we do? Number one is pray. And you guys, you're like, oh, genius, Adam. Never thought of that. So glad you're here to tell us that we should pray. All right, but sometimes we need to be reminded because if you're honest, some of you aren't praying. You're not praying because you don't know what it's doing. You don't know what happens when you pray. You've tried it and nothing seemed to happen. And so you're like, I'm I'm not sure what's going on here. I'm not, God, would you please just shine a spotlight? Would you... Shine a spotlight on what's supposed to happen when I pray. Would you would just lay it all out really clearly? If I ask for this and I don't get it, what does that mean? I, I want some answers. But he doesn't often give those answers. And sometimes we find ourselves in the dark. And when we pray, despite our lack of clarity about how prayer works, we are demonstrating trust in God's faithfulness and his power and that he is good. So even when you're not sure what's happening, pray. Number two, Also, it's gonna be groundbreaking, earth-shattering. You're not gonna believe I'm about to say this. Write it down. Read the Bible. (laughs) Read the Bible. Really? Read the Bible? Why would you say that? Because I think sometimes, first of all, I'm pretty sure some of you are not reading the Bible at all. You're just not. And and, and you've, you've got all these reasons why. I tried it. I don't understand it. I don't have time. I hate reading. You've got all these reasons. But there's a part of us that, that when we read the Bible, we have this expectation that something amazing is gonna happen. And when it doesn't happen, we go, oh, well, you know, this doesn't work or I don't understand how this works. I, I feel like I'm in the dark every time I read scripture and, and I just wish God would shine a spotlight and make it clear. Like I, I hear other people talk. I hear Adam talk and Andy and Matthew and Amber. And, and they talk, when they talk, they, they sound like they understand scripture and I don't understand scripture. So something's wrong with me or God, would you just shine a spotlight on this for me? But when we read scripture, despite our lack of clarity about how it works, we demonstrate trust that God is faithful and powerful, that he's good. So what if you don't know exactly how it works? Do it anyway, because God is good. And when we read scripture, whether we know it or not, we are learning how to be with our creator, our father. And that's a good thing. Okay, a couple more. Um, uh, This one, you might be surprised that's on this list, but it's forgive. Forgive, forgive. Some of you are not forgiving. You're holding something, you're holding on to something, someone hurt you, and you're, you're, you have the right to hold it against them. You're, you, that's true. You do have, when someone hurts you, you have the right to hold it against them. Forgiveness is saying, 
I let go of it. I let go of the right to hold this against you. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? It's letting them off the hook. Why would I do that? I don't understand how forgiveness makes things better. But when you forgive, despite the lack of clarity about how it works, you're demonstrating faithfulness or demonstrating confidence in the power of God and his goodness. Second, tell the truth. Like just always, always, always tell the truth. You're like, well, I'm not, I'm not a liar. Do you always tell the truth? Do you tell the truth even when it's gonna make you look bad? Even when it might hurt someone's feelings or damage a relationship? Do you tell the truth then? Just always tell the truth. Well, I don't understand how this is gonna, if I tell the truth here, I'm gonna get in trouble or they're gonna be mad at me. I don't understand how that's gonna work out. It's okay, do it anyway. When we tell the truth, despite a lack of clarity about how everything's gonna work out, we're demonstrating trust that God is good and faithful. He knows how things are supposed to work in humans. Finally, give generously. Just give generously. As I said before, I love that story about Mitch Album and Maury and giving makes, makes you feel like living. When we give generously, it's an opportunity to demonstrate trust and faithfulness. And you say, well, I don't know. I don't know where, how God's gonna provide. I don't know how I'm gonna reach my financial goals. I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm gonna feel safe and secure about where I'm at financially if I give generously. I mean, I can give a little, but it's not gonna be generous. Oh man, when we do it anyway, when we give generously despite our lack of clarity about how God's gonna work it all out, we're demonstrating trust that he's good and faithful, powerful, and he'll provide. This is an opportunity for us when we find ourselves in the dark. One of, one of the big misunderstandings that non-Christians have about Christians <clears throat> is they think, well, those people act like they've got it all figured out. <laughs> No, we don't. Uh, we don't. We don't have it all figured out. You, you spend much time around me, you'll go, yep, he does not have it all figured out. But that's, that's the misunderstanding. That's the assumption. We think we've got it all figured out. When we're able to show people like, you know what? I don't have it all figured out. Sometimes I don't know what's happening when I pray. Sometimes I don't understand what I read in scripture. Sometimes I, I'm not sure how forgiveness is gonna make things better or telling the truth is gonna keep me safe or giving generously is gonna provide for my family. I don't know how all that's gonna work out but I do it anyway because I trust that God is smart, smarter than me. He's good. He loves me. He is with me. And when I act like God is good, I get to experience God's goodness. I do it anyway, even when I don't understand all of it, even when I have my doubts, even when I have moments where I feel like, well, I tried that and it seemed to go backwards instead of forwards. God is still good. So we act in courage despite our lack of clarity. And that is what I think shines a spotlight on Jesus. We need to quit worrying about the spotlight being on our future or being on us. And we need to, we need to shine the spotlight on Jesus. And we do that by demonstrating courage in this way. I'm gonna close this with a word of prayer. <clears throat> I'm just gonna invite you as you sit and pray to think about where in your life is there a gap between what you know about God's goodness, his faithfulness, his desire to be with you, his instructions for holy living, and what you wish you knew? How things are gonna work out, how this is gonna make things better, how am I gonna be okay? Where is that gap in your life? And where can you demonstrate some courage showing that you trust that God is good? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have this morning to study and sing and pray and, and commune together. God, it's just a blessing. <clears throat> and I just ask that you would open my heart and, and the hearts of my brothers and sisters here this morning to um, understand how we can act in faith even when we feel like we're in the dark, how we can trust you. And, and I, God, I pray that if, if there's anyone here who's been hurt by your people, that you would, you would show them that you see them, that you hear them, and that you care. God, as we learn to just live this out with courage and confidence, would you just draw people to Jesus through that? <clears throat> We're not asking, God, that you, you make our, life, make our you know, bank accounts grow or give us success in all these worldly ways. We just wanna see a spotlight shined on Jesus. And if we can do that through our actions, God, would you do that for the glory of your name? In Christ's name we pray, amen.